I'm Bruce Miller. I run the Memory and Aging Center. I'm, I'm going to say a few words in a minute, but uh, I'll be moderating the event. And the, the speakers tonight, uh, for the most part, are going to introduce themselves in panels. Um, uh, but uh, I'm going to let uh, Shira Kamen uh, begin, and uh, she is uh, well known throughout the, the Bay Area community, um, plays medieval uh, strings and uh, modern strings, uh, and I think you've already gotten a flavor of uh, the exciting things that she does. So thank you, Shira. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, so just a few words from me. I'm uh, ill-suited to moderate uh, this area where uh, you're going to hear from innovators, leaders, poets, people who think about this topic uh, in very original way. Um, Jane Hirschfeld, uh, who is responsible for the evening, um, suggested, and I completely agree, that we dedicate the evening to Nelson Mandela, who has been a huge figure, I think, in all of our lives. So. A word about this program. So um, it's a sad night for me in many ways. Um, this is the last event uh, of our visiting artist, Jane Hirschfeld. Um, she, uh, the, the um, Hellman family have a, endowed a visiting artist for the Memory and Aging Center. And uh, this year, our visiting artist has been Jane Hirschfeld, who has transformed our program um, and I think our patients. And uh, 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 just a word about uh, the events that we've had this year. First, Jane read to the Memory and Aging Center, the 150 uh, scientists, researchers, uh, clinicians who look after patients with degenerative diseases, which are almost all fatal at the moment, um, uh, talking about tonight. Um, we then uh, uh, read our favorite po uh, poems. Um, I read something from Bob Dylan, but uh, there was a number of other uh, people who read that evening and um, uh, did really beautiful things. The third event uh, which we had here in our Mission Bay campus uh, was uh, uh, focused around uh, neuroscience and poetry, and we had a um, uh, discussion uh, about language uh, by Mari Lugorno Tempini, our language expert, emotion by Virginia Sturm, who is an emotion uh, expert, 
Uh, and then we just had a fantastic uh, set of readings uh, that Jane led. Uh, we had uh, Kay Ryan. It was really, an, uh, I would say, one of the most amazing nights I've, I've ever been at, and, and now we have tonight. Um, so I'm just going to say just a couple more words um, uh, about uh, death and poetry and um, spirituality. Um, I moved to San Francisco in 1998, and uh, I started running my dog in uh, Golden Gate Park, and I experienced something that I think uh, is very unusual. Um, people call it a crow funeral, and I was running with my dog Max, and uh, uh, just in, in front of the entrance into Golden Gate Park, um, I saw uh, crows that were coming down from the telephone wires back and forth toward a crow in the road that had uh, just been killed. And, um, uh, this went on for a couple minutes, and then it stopped entirely, and um, uh, when we came back, uh, the crows were doing their ordinary uh, behavior. So uh, going to come back to that in just one second. I trained in medicine and uh, uh, finished in 1978. Uh, did not ever once have the topic of uh, death or dying uh, ever breached in my uh, medical school uh, training, which I thought was good in many ways. Finished my residency in neurology without ever having discussed uh, death and dying with any um, uh, of my incredible faculty who taught me about the brain and neurology. Um, spent uh, 18 years on faculty at UCLA and uh, I think never heard a cogent discussion about patients uh, who were in the process of dying and how they might want to die and what uh, death and dignity uh, might uh, mean. Um, I think it, at this time, uh, you know, extraordinary time in medicine, um, uh, there were people on the edges um, of our field who were making huge contributions to this uh, area. They were poets. Um, you'll hear some of them tonight. Um, uh, they were um, artists. They were uh, people um, uh, who were just uh, beginning this palliative care uh, area in neurology. And uh, we have, I think, an extraordinary uh, palliative care group at uh, UCLA, uh, I think started by Steve uh, McPhee and uh, now led by Steve Panelot. So uh, I think we're changing, but uh, we still have lots to learn. And you know, I, I think uh, about the crows and the way they approach death, uh, and um, you know, I think it was a little bit the way uh, we used to approach death in, in medicine. And I, I, I don't understand exactly what was going on in their minds, and I may be underestimating them. But um, uh, uh, anyways, I think as a species, we are starting to really come to grips with this very important uh, uh, question about how we want to die, uh, what is a dignified death, um, how as healers can we help uh, people with this process. Um, so uh, our first uh, uh, event for this evening is going to be Sandra Gilbert. Um, very excited to hear her uh, uh, read. I've uh, read her book uh, recently. She's a feminist. She's a leading poet. She's written a lot about uh, death and dying. And uh, she and Shira Kamen are going to perform together. The other uh, speakers will introduce themselves as the panels progress tonight. Thank you. I'm so honored to be here. I'm uh, technology phobic, so I need to be sure that you can hear me. We hear you. Everything working all right? You have a great speaker system. No, someone is coming to adjust it. <laughs> this is typical of my life. Um, <laughs> it's a special thrill to be here. I'm, I'm so honored that Jane invited me and um, delighted to meet uh, Bruce and to connect with old friends from my wonderful Berkeley. It was really a death and dying potluck group, but we, but <laughs> euphemistically we called it the life and death potluck group. But two of our members, Steve McPhee and Guy Miko, are also speaking tonight. Uh, I'm going to read a sonnet sequence called a corona that I wrote in memory of uh, my mother, Angela, Maria Incoronata Caruso Mortola, who died at the age of 97 in 2001. She 
had a Lewy body syndrome, so this seems like a place where people will understand her problems and her symptoms. She presented with uh, complete visual hallucinations and believed that her beautiful apartment in Jackson Heights was inhabited by what she called co-tenants. And the co-tenants were particularly scary to her because she, her apartment was rent controlled. And she thought that if you didn't sell your rent controlled apartment to the co-op board, the, the, the New York rent control board made you take co-tenants. So she suffered from that. And in the last three months of her life, I went and got her in Jackson Heights, Queens, and uh, brought her out here to California where she died uh, three months later in a nursing home. So it wasn't a long ordeal, but it was a, a dreadful one. Uh, she was particularly unhappy to be separated from her belongings. That's where I get the title of this sonnet sequence and of the book that it is the title poem of. Uh, she had been a Sicilian immigrant who came here at the age of seven and uh, managed somehow to move from Williamsburg, from the Sicilian ghetto in Williamsburg, which was then a Sicilian ghetto, though now you know it's very hip, uh, to Jackson Heights, which she felt was a great step up to be in Queens. And she was very obsessed with the loss of her belongings when she came out here. Uh, a corona, which is what this sequence is, is a sequence of sonnets where the last line of uh, every sonnet provides the first line of the following sonnet. So the sonnets are linked, and they are a crown. Uh, they, I, when I get to the end, you'll see that the last line of the whole group will uh, remind you of the first line of the group, if, if you remember it. Um, it was particularly strange to me when I wrote this because I knew I wanted to write something about my mother. I thought it would be prose. I've always written sonnets, though, but I had never written a corona. And I found myself doing this. And then I remembered that my mother's confirmation name was in Coronata. Mm. Oh, strange other ways of the mind. I'll just go right through without telling you the numbers. In and out, sun, like the light of her mind that knows and doesn't, feels and forgets. Pelts of rain hide and seek of thought, first gray, then rose, but still a steady backlight, sometimes hidden. Remember Woody Allen's line, I'm not like that. I don't care when it happens, where. I just don't want to die. Not, not scared, not that. I just don't want to, and I, I told the doctor. And the doctor, laughing, cute old lady, said she doesn't care about the why and wherefore. She just doesn't want to die. And therefore, then she forgets, smiles, turns her head to nod, grand dame, at shadows on the walls that gather where the light collects and falls. They gather where the light collects and falls. We can't see them, but she seems to think at least a few are smiling. So she feels she has to say hello, politely thank these thoughtful ghosts who visit, sister, brothers, Sunday best in black, old Brooklyn friends who hardly see the gulf of 60 years, mama and papa, severe Sicilian bookends. Come in, come in, her eyes light up, she waves and beckons all to chairs around her bed so she can boast to brothers and their wives of all the special things her daughter did and how her grandkids won so many prizes. And as she vaunts and glows, her smile blazes. But though she glows, but though her smile blazes, the sister flickers, fades, the brothers falter, her eyesight's bad. It's hard to see their faces as if she peered through gauze or a thick filter. And then the others come, the ones she calls co-tenants of her rooms, the lovers screwing, coarses, goats in corners, nasty girls, smart aleck guys who do know what they're doing, and what they do is occupy her place. Back home, they swarmed all over her apartment, set up a stove behind her lovely bookcase, nursed babies on her sofa, bold and different. And even here, still shameless in their clingings, they mean to steal. They'll steal her best belongings. 
What should she do to safeguard her belongings? She begs for help, urges us to lock, to triple lock the doors to hide her things. Her pearls right here, her fruit wood in New York, her mother's hand-carved chairs, the leather surface desk at which my father sat so long ago, wearing the cashmere sweater Grandma bought him and the sulka shirt. Listen, are we listening? Have we heard? How well he dressed, how beautiful their place. Four rooms in Queens, what lots couldn't afford in an age of breadlines, shameful jobs, or worse. Tona de Dio! Thunder of God, she looses the curse she learned in childhood for most uses. The curses learned in childhood have their uses. Tona de Dio, she swears when they strip her bare to bathe her. Tona de Dio, when the nurses slide the soiled bed pads to the floor or prop her in the wheelchair to be fed. Thunder of God echoes along the halls when she tries to fight the husky nurse's aide come to sponge her bruises, stains, and spills. Embarrassed, we shiver in the corridor while she flails and shrieks for the police. Tona de Dio, call the police! God's thunder will scorch us if we leave her in this place, away from her apartment, calm and peace, away from her belongings, purse, and keys away from her belongings, purse and keys, and crumpled Kleenex, reading glasses, coins, and comb she always carries in that purse. She isn't real. She might be only bones. Yet the belongings, longings, must go on. The bookcase and the rugs and tables must survive, outlast her. So she tells her grandson how to plan an auction in the East. These are the costs of those belongings, that the value of mahogany, and this the price of sterling silver, which she fought to buy, a fifth grade teacher in the 30s, and the bracelets of furs her in-laws gave. Too bad they can't go with her to the grave. What happens to belongings after the grave? They'll be up here, and she, she'll be down there. What of the stuff she worked so hard to have? Polished mahogany and mink and silver, and even the 15-year-old television, still good, still just right for the nightly news, and the brand new vacuum cleaner, even still uh, something someone ought to choose. Her face is crumpling like a handkerchief. Don't give it all away. Don't give it up. If you don't want it, at least sell it off. Don't let the others have it either. Stop the thieves before they drag it all away. Don't let my belongings go astray. Don't let my belongings go astray. Call the super. Tell the doorman. Keep the windows locked and barred the crooks away. The ones who break and enter when you sleep. The ones who follow sullen knife and rape. How many years she's warned us. Can't we hear? They'll pick the locks. They'll climb the fire escape. Just look. The crooks are here, are everywhere. A sudden nod, a glance at the next bed where a wizened person gasps and snores. That one now. She saw her. Yes, she did. Peering in closets, rummaging in drawers. Even in hospitals, they have no pity. They rob you when they see your things are pretty. Yet, oh, it's nice that all her things are pretty. Her smile blazes back in Jackson Heights on one of the better blocks in New York City. Her beautiful apartment basks and waits. A hush of rugs, a drawn Venetian blind, keeping the silence, keeping the bars of shadow gathered like silent guardians around the hanging shelf, the wedgewood, the piano. And there the family photographs are masked. My father's face blade thin in sepia. My baby self in flounces or undressed from times when she was poor but happier. Belongings, blurry, as if underwater, bearing the prints of mother, father, daughter. How far the age of mother, father, daughter my baby room with walls, now pink, now blue, but never yellow, though I begged, I fought her. 
and the tiny snowman globe where snowflakes flew, and the little silver Virgin Mary shrine whose key I turned to play Our Lady's song, Ave Maria, tinkling out of tune, and the gray hooked rug where silent bluebirds sang and a rabbit ran away among the trees but never vanished, never could escape whatever chased him from the knitted haze. A scary thing, because it had no shape, though now the whole room's painted hazy gray and the rabbit trees and birds raveled away. When did her mind begin to ravel away? That time she fell outside the beauty parlor getting pretty for her grandson's birthday? She didn't answer when we tried to call her. And soon, with mop and broom, she fought the others, called 911, the super, the police. There, on the sofa, sat the nursing mothers. The lovers crawled and thrashed under the bookcase. We flew to Queens. We packed up all her things, the fox head furs, her mother's lion necklace. But what about all my other best belongings? She worried, then gave up, resigned to silence. A roar of takeoff, buckled in, she hissed, here's to my new adventure in the West. At sundown, tantrums shake the sunset west. The nurses turn her toward the flashing windows. See the flowers? See the pretty bird's nest? Bushes tug in tubs on the patio where a night wind rises over astroturf batters the waiting tables, chairs, and wheelchairs, as if they stood in a swirl of Pacific surf whose icy water glitters, darkens, clears. Here's dinner, hon. The nurse's aide with bib holds out a tray of lukewarm grown-up mush. Last, fall, last week, a fall tore muscles, cracked a rib. How did she fall? Did someone really push? She tries to remember. Strains to see, remembers sometimes the names of sundown visitors. Sometimes the names of sundown visitors hook into thought. Sometimes the sounds unravel, blur, sister, brothers, TV commentators, Frank and Vito turn into Ted Koppel. I visit afternoons, bring cupcakes, chocolate, the only stuff she ever wants to eat. Can barely swallow, though. One night, past midnight, she coughs a little, chokes on her own spit. The night nurse didn't hear the radio, didn't hear the radio was turned on loud. She's kind of scared and sorry and puts a rose on the poor old lady's pillow. And the mortician calls and tells us not to worry. Above the sunlit bay, the slicing planes rise fast and one speeds east with her remains. Back among her belongings, her remains glide north-northwest in a shiny SUV designed to weather snowstorms, freezing rains. Far from the simmering fields of Sicily, the East Coast cemetery stony pressed into a cleft of hills. Black ice I skid on, leaning to greet the freckled, hardy priest, looking, not looking, at the box she's laid in, at the edge of the polished boards that hold her husband. The priest says the words she scorned. She didn't believe. She has to be blessed to belong to holy ground. And oh, she would scold us if she were still alive. No tone de Dio, no bolt so fierce and true as the light of her mind that felt, that thought, that knew. <laughs>